Good morning. My name is Bob Hauser, and I'm Executive Officer of the American Philosophical Society. I'm pleased to welcome you to Day 2 of Women in Science, Achievement in Barrier and Barriers, hosted by the American Philosophical Society. I hope you uh, join me in, in, uh, in uh, believing that yesterday was fantastic. Uh, and so uh, I'm really looking forward, as we all are, to today. The American Philosophical Society acknowledges with respect that it resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the, the, the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with this land continue to this day. We recognize their continued presence and perseverance despite centuries of land theft, removal, and persecution of their language and cultural traditions. Throughout its history, the society has benefited from its resident in this part of Lenape land, which we now call Philadelphia. We at the APS honor the Lenape community and those of many, many other Native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research awards, and engagement activities. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 with the mission of promoting useful knowledge. Most of our nation's founders were members, and the APS had Thomas Jefferson as its president for 17 years, during most of which time he was either vice president or president of the United States. Like the Constitution, the presidency, the Congress, and the courts, as a keeper of knowledge, the society was an essential piece of the bedrock on which our new nation was founded almost 250 years ago. It remains so today. Although we at the APS are proud of our 280-year history, I think it's especially important to recall, recognize, and reject less salutary parts of that story. While we at the Society continue to honor Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and other founding members for their key roles in the formation of our nation, for their leadership of the Society, and for their devotion to science, to education, and other noble causes, we're also much aware of their faults. Most significantly, their slaveholding and racial, racist beliefs. Also, during the 19th century, Members of the APS were creators of so-called scientific racism, and in the first half of the 20th century, APS members were leaders of the eugenics movement. And if you know the history of the society, uh, we elected a woman first uh, before the end of the 18th century, uh, Princess Dashkova, who was kind of a rival of, of Catherine the Great in Russia, and therefore was assigned science as a way of keeping her out of the way. Uh, and she was a pal of Ben, uh, of ben Franklin. And, and, uh, but then it took another 90 years before any more women were elected to membership in the society. Today, we elect roughly equal numbers of men and of women each year. The leadership of the society during the time that I have been here has been dominated by women, uh, chairs of all of our class committees, as well as Linda Greenhouse as president. And I'm very happy to have been in, the, in an organization that has made those kinds of changes. Uh, we now have approximately a quarter of the membership women, and that is gradually, of course, going to continue to increase. In any event, going back to racism and the like, we at the APS totally reject the earlier immoral practices and unscientific doctrines. We're committed to sustaining the better parts of our founders' legacies while working towards a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. Uh, think about those first letter, lead letters. That's the APS idea. In the 21st century, we sustain Ben Franklin's mission in three principal ways. We honor and engage leading scholars, scientists, and professionals 
through elected membership and opportunities for interdisciplinary intellectual fellowship. The Society remains a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. We promote research by providing over a million and a half dollars a year in research grants and fellowships, primarily to the younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. You can check our website to learn more about what we're doing and for news of forthcoming events. Um, for those of you, and I'm not sure there are many, uh, who were unable to attend yesterday's session, um, today's conference was inspired by the Society's 2023 20, exhibition, Pursuit and Persistence, 300 Years of Women in Science, which is now open through December of this year. Admission, of course, is free, and we hope that you might take some time during today's lunch or after today's sessions to visit the exhibition, which is located over yonder um, uh, at 104 South 5th Street in Philosophical Hall, the original building of the Society, which was uh, dates to 1789, a wonderful, interesting year, uh, and was paid for by a loan from, guess who? Benjamin Franklin. Um, anyway, um, continuing the topics introduced yesterday, today's proceedings will explore the history of women in science, the present state of science and society, and opportunities to create a more inclusive and diverse practice of science. In the meantime, a few housekeeping points. Today's conference is being live streamed, and we invite you to follow along on the Society's social media accounts using the hashtag at APS Women in STEM. We'll also be taking questions from BoxCast, and we encourage you to type your questions at any point during today's session. For those of you attending in person, coffee and light refreshments will be provided throughout the day, and bathrooms are located downstairs as well as a woman's restroom just out there to the left on the first floor. With those preliminaries aside, I'd like to introduce Pamela Henson, who will be chairing this morning's session on research strategies. Pamela Henson is the historian for the history of the Smithsonian in the strategic initiatives and programs of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, where she has served since 1974. With a 1990 PhD in history and philosophy of science, she does research, publication, exhi exhibits, websites, and oral history interviews. Her research interests include the history of the Smithsonian museums, natural history, minority and women's history, and the use of oral history and visual materials. She's taught oral history at American University for over a decade. Dr. Dr. Henson. So are we on? Yeah, good. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists this morning. Um, first, next to me, we have Odile Lanen. Uh, she's a PhD student at the Durham University and she holds an AHRC Collaborative Doctoral Award and is writing a thesis. It's on. It's on. If you could just hold it a little closer. Hold it closer? That, there we go. Okay, so Odile Lennon, uh, she's a PhD student at Durham University. 
She holds an AHRC Collaborative Doctoral Award and is writing a thesis on celestial mechanics, Caroline Herschel, Astronomical Notebooks and Material Culture, a Pre-Digital Communication System. Um, we're going to hear about that today. And her project partnered with the Royal Society of London, where they have a rich collection of Herschel manuscripts that have been preserved. Um, and she's presently interested in the material and visual culture of science, especially aspects of scientific knowledge production that reveal the hidden agency of people whose contributions have thus far not been fully acknowledged. So she has a passion also for audiovisual research communication, uh, which she hopes to apply to her own project in the future. We also have Christine Palmieri, and she's a historian of science and knowledge in the German and English-speaking world. Uh, and she looks at the history of scholarly practices and research methods uh, and the mutually constitutive relationship between science and society, as well as the embeddedness of knowledge in specific cultural and political contexts. And these foci provide a unifying framework for her research um, on the history of philology in Germany, the history of human sciences in Europe, including Britain, and the history of women in science. And she has a long-standing interest in the history of European encounters with others, um, as well as new interest in the history of astronomy and astrophysics and the global history of modern science. And so she's a member of the Capturing the Stars Research Group at the University of Chicago. I love that title. Um, <laughs> And she's been looking. I put that in the talk, so you can actually cut that paragraph. OK. Um, <laughs> I misunderstood the assignment. <laughs> and she uh, got her PhD from the Committee on Conceptual and Historical Studies in the department um, at University of Chicago. And she's currently a postdoctoral researcher, uh, at, an instructor at the university's Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. And down the end is Jenna Tan. Uh, she's an assistant professor of the practice in the Department of Engineering at Boston College. She's a historian of science, technology, and engineering, specializing in historical issues related to women and gender in STEM fields, engineering design and accessibility, and the history of the life sciences. So um, can we start our session today with Odile's presentation? I'm assuming it's the green button. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so I'm working on how to recover the agency of women in science by examining manuscript cultures. And my case study is Carolyn Herschel. Um, I'm sure many of you will have heard of her. She was an early modern researcher in astronomy, credited with her discovery of eight comets. And she was the first woman to publish in the transactions of the Royal Society. Um, this cartoon shows, um, uh, makes a reference to some of these discoveries. So um, here in the caption at the bottom, it says, um, the female philosopher smelling out the comet. And then in her speech bubble, what a strong sulfurous scent proceeds from this meteor. And then we've got in the corner this meteor baby here essentially farting into her telescope. Um, <laughs> So obviously this cartoon is, is massively making fun of her, ridiculing her um, as a woman in science. Um, but at the same time, it shows um, that she was at least somewhat visible. She was somewhat recognized um, for her contributions. And um, that was certainly the case for her independent discoveries um, that she made through her own telescope. Um, these have very much been celebrated in the historical literature. Herschel, however, also um, made significant contributions to her brother's publications. Um, and there the story so far is still very much one of Carolyn S. Williams' passive assistant, his scribe. Um, she is recognized as having been important for his work, but no real agency is attributed to her in that role. And so in this paper, I argue that we can challenge that, um, and we can do so through um, detailed study of the Herschel manuscripts, and um, importantly, by considering them not just as texts, but as objects of inquiry in their own right. 
So in the next few minutes, I will briefly introduce my case study, the nebulae register sheets, and then I will talk about these three ways in which I think a close study of this manuscript can reveal Herschel's agency in new ways. Um, so this is um, the, the manuscript I'm talking about. There are five of these um, boxes of loose sheets that are kept at the Royal Society in London. And this manuscript was part of the Herschel sweep campaign. So this was essentially their um, project of systematically studying the sky and cataloging nebulae and star clusters. Um, and here on the left, the Im image of the telescope, that was the, the telescope that they were using. Um, the Herschels were famous for building these incredibly powerful telescopes, um, which meant that they could simply see things that we, we just hadn't been able to see before in that way, and that's why their work was so revolutionary at the time. And then here the image on the right is just one of the three catalogues um, in which their work was ultimately published. So my analysis of the handwriting in this manuscript has confirmed that they are largely written in Carolyn's hand. Um, however, interestingly, also interspersed with her brother William's hand. Um, and um, here, the, the bottom um, section that I've circled in red, that's Carolyn's hand. Um, the top entry is, is William's handwriting. And this is really interesting because it, it hints at the kind of co-production that was going on here. So it was not, um, rather than a kind of clear divide of um, William as the astronomer and Carolyn as his subordinate assistant, uh, they were really um, using and, and creating this document together. So now the first way of revealing Herschel's agency is um, through highlighting the decisions and the skills that were involved in designing these manuscripts to function as efficient information management devices. So um, this is a, a typical page. Um, they, the Herschels would usually assign one page for each object and then give that um, a general number. That's the number circled here on the top right corner. They would give each object a title and then a class number. And these class numbers were basically numbers from one to eight that would group these objects into categories of their visual appearance. Um, and then we've got the, these various entries, and they were extracts that were copied from other observing notebooks. And importantly, Herschel would always make sure to specify where exactly this information had originally come from. So here, the top entry, the number 479, um, actually refers to page number 479 in the fixed stars series, and that is that manuscript here on the right. Um, so these are three other manuscripts that are directly connected to the register sheet. So um, she was copying information from these into the register sheets, and that really shows how all of these manuscripts were part of a much larger and um, complicated and purposefully designed system for information management and processing. Now, another way in which we can reveal Herschel's agency is, um, is by studying her practice of transcribing information from one notebook into another. And I argue that that was not at all um, a passive activity. So, firstly, not everything that was originally recorded would actually end up in the register sheets. Um, so there was a constant element of decision making of what information should be transferred and which bits should be omitted. Um, secondly, um, um, transcribing meant reordering data. So um, we can see in the, in the original transcript, it's structured by sweep numbers. Um, so they, these were basically just different observing sessions. Whereas in the register sheets, information is structured into object categories. And what this meant was that Herschel had to know which observations she deemed to have been of the same object to then group them together. Um, and that was not at all self-evident. There was a whole lot of skill and judgment involved in figuring this out. On top of that, um, comparing these manuscripts also reveals that Herschel was making additions. So um, the sections highlighted in blue here are a word-for-word -word, um, copy, um, which makes sense. I don't know if you can see that, but number it says here five, page number 507, and, and then top here as well, page number 507. So um, it, it, these, the, this was transcribed from that page. Um, 
But then the, the green section here is nowhere to be found in the original. So that was, that was added, which shows how Herschel was capable of um, using her knowledge of this project and of astronomy in general to interpret and augment um, the information that she was transferring. Now, finally, uh, the nebulae register sheets were a working document that was right at the center of knowledge production. And a good example, I think, of this are uh, the nebulae class numbers, which are the numbers in the top left corner. And basically, when we look at these in a bit more detail here, um, we can see that there are these drafted um, pencil class numbers underneath the pen that were written before the pen. In a lot of the cases, they coincide with, with the pen that was written over it, but there are also examples where they changed. And two, I've got two of them on the screen here. Um, on the right, for example, um, it changed from class number four, um, which was a planetary nebula, to class number five, a very large nebula. So this really shows um, the work in progress nature of this manuscript that was really used as a tool to experiment on which nebulae should be grouped together. And I think given the loose leaf nature of this manuscript, it is entirely possible that they would even have physically rearranged these sheets into different groupings of drafted class numbers. So to sum up, um, I hope to have shown that close study of manuscript culture can be an extremely powerful way to reveal unacknowledged contributions of women in science. And in this particular case, um, I've argued that uh, nebulae register sheets were co-produced, that they were a purposefully designed, sorry, <laughs> purposefully designed system uh, for informa information management and processing, um, that there was significant agency in the practice of transcribing, um, and finally, that note-taking was really right at the center of knowledge production. It was part of processes like observing, interpreting, and classifying, and Carolyn Herschel was heavily involved in all of these. Thank you very much. have to do anything to get it up, right? Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to our fabulous hosts and for all of the organizational work that I know has gone into bringing us all here. So I wanted to start today by actually giving some context for this paper, because as I was telling some of you last night, and I know as um, Pam just mentioned, I'm actually part of a larger research group at the University of Chicago that is working on a wide array of materials, <clears throat> excuse me, from the University of Chicago, uh, sorry, wide array of materials from Yerkes Observatory. And the side of the project that I'm in charge of, which is focused on reconstructing both the scientific contributions and the lived experiences of women who worked at Yerkes Observatory in the early 20th century, grew out of a larger initiative that was looking at the collection of over 175,000 glass plates that we have at the observatory that were created over almost a 100-year period, starting in the late 19th century. And so since 2019, my colleagues at the University of Chicago Library and the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics have been working to develop methods and procedures that utilize low barrier, financially accessible equipment for the digitization of these plates so as to make them and their data available for both scientific and historical research. So the background image that we have here is actually one of the, the plates that our team has scanned. It's one of the Barnard Atlas plates and we've inverted it so it actually looks like what you think the night sky should look like. Um, and this one actually was made with an off the shelf Epson scanner, uh, which is Really exciting. Um, we're now using some fancier equipment, but my heart is still with the Epson. So um, at, the, at the time when they're doing this, the team was also working with the observatory's logbooks. And this contains reams of vital data about the plates themselves. And this led them to ask more questions about, you know, how are these plates being made? Who were they being made by? And so this took my colleagues to the archive. 
and they began consulting materials um, in special collections in order to try to answer these questions when they found this photo. And so this is a photo from 1921. Do I have a, is there a pointy thing here too? Yeah, yes, maybe. It's there, I can't see it. Okay, anyway, the, Einstein is in the middle. Um, and so this, yeah, is the photo from when Einstein came to visit the observatory in Williams Bay in 1921. And the team looked at this and they realized that there were far more women in the photo than they might have initially anticipated. And so, I realize my computer is blocking, so that's why I keep looking away. Um, and so this piqued the group's interest in finding out more information about these women and what they, who they were, what they were doing, what kinds of work, why they went to the observatory in the first place, and what happened to them after they left. So much to our very good fortune, someone had the wherewithal to write the names of everyone in the photo on the image, um, which was just marvelous. This never happens. Um, and so this is, this is kind of where I get involved with the project, or unless you guys have lots of photos of names. OK. Uh, so this is where I got involved with the project. And so I was originally brought on to write a series of short biographies about the, specifically the women in this photo. But then, as soon as I started getting into the archives, I was just absolutely astounded by the amount of material that we had and the amount of phenomenal information that was contained. And just in general, kind of as our colleagues were talking about last night about your archives, like the sheer number of voices of the women that we could reclaim from these archival materials that were just not in any finding aids. So to date, and we, we've only made it through the collection from about 1900 to 1930 thus far, but we've already found the names of over 120 women who were in some capacity writing to or corresponding with just Director Frost. So this is just from the Frost files. And so kind of this, this realization just how many women were in our records and the increasing realization as we went through these papers that women participated in every stage of research and every stage of work at the observatory led us or kind of motivated us to start thinking about how we could demonstrate the myriad of ways in which women's labor was essential for the pursuit of science at Yerkes, while also challenging contemporary notions about what it means to do science and what kind of work gets to count as scientific and who gets to count as a scientist. So in particular, my hope is that our research will help shift narratives about women's work in the history of astronomy and astrophysics beyond these kind of limited accounts of female calculators in order to embrace the full range of women's labor, which also included, just to name a few, observing, photographing, oh my god, calculating, uh, measuring, analyzing, and publishing. And so, this is, that's kind of one part of the project. Another part of the, the project aims to reveal how women at Yerkes conceptualized themselves as astronomers and as women. To answer questions about why they became involved with the observatory and just to kind of give them back their agency in these, these narratives about, about their lives. And that's not what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna focus on the work, but I, I do especially just wanna flag that given the conversations we were having yesterday. So for the remaining time, I just wanna focus a little bit on this topic of labor in order to oh so very briefly talk about the paper itself, which speaks directly to two of the other points that emerged in our conversations yesterday. One on this question about the visibility or invisibility of women and the other on the ways in which texts are privileged in research. So, because, and this is because the two women on whom this paper focuses, Mary Ross Calvert, who is circled there, um, and Alice Hall Farnsworth, are arguably the most visible of the women from Yerkes. And this is because their names did appear in print. So this is, this is why we know who they are. Um, and actually, both of them already have Wikipedia pages, which is wonderful. Um, and... But, but in, in the particular cases that I focused on for this paper, which concerned the publication first of a photographic atlas of selected regions of the Milky Way and then zone 
um, 45 of Captain's selected areas, photographic photometry for 1,550 stars, both of which were published in 1927. In these two instances, authorial credit was still given to dead men. Barnard and Parkhurst, who are also seen here in life in this photo. And Cal Calvert and Ross were named, but they weren't named as authors, right? So what does this say? This raises a series of questions for me about the ways in which the allocation of credit generally and author an authorial credit more specifically can simultaneously attest to and efface the scientific labor of women. So in other words, while we know that getting published was and is an achievement, um, and while it's undoubtedly important that both Ross and Calvert were credited on the title pages of these publications, their contributions were nevertheless labeled as ancillary. So I've started calling this the credit puzzle, which you know, is something that I could obviously say a lot more about, and please do read the paper, because that's where I do it. Um, I did want to just take this time on stage to just introduce you to Calvert and Farnsworth themselves a little bit more briefly in the now less than two minutes that I have. So Mary Ross Calvert, seen here, uh, was born in Nashville, Tennessee in 1984. She did attend high school, but didn't finish. She left sometimes after her, sometime after her second year and went to work as a bookkeeper in the family's photography studio. She moved to Williams Bay in 1905 to work for her uncle, Edward Emerson Barnard, who was already a famous astronomer. But her responsibilities at the observatory grew exponentially. So um, to skip over a lot of fun stuff, my favorite is this picture here on the bottom where they're at the um, Green River Eclipse Expedition. And she was um, director for us, kind of right-hand man for organizing and arranging and getting that entire trip expedition set up. Um, she was eventually promoted to the rank of assistant of the observatory, although this did not include a pay raise, which is something else we can discuss. Um, and she remained at Yerkes until 1946 when she returned to Nashville in order to return uh, to help run the family's uh, photography studio. So finally, we have Farnsworth, who was born in Massachusetts. She went to Mount Holyoke, um, studied astronomy with Anne Sewell Young, earned a bachelor's degree before then going to Chicago to earn both a master's and then a PhD. So again, we have two very different kind of life narratives in these two women, but yet they still are kind of having the same issue with regards to the ways in which their labor is being recognized and credited. So I will end here except to make two points, again, based on our conversations. One is that we have these portraits of said men in our archival collection at Chicago and not of any of the women. And two, we found this photo on the left. We think it's Farnsworth. We actually don't know for sure. But we didn't originally find it because it was just labeled astronomer at telescope. So in the question of who are we going to call a female astronomer versus astronomer, I was very pleased that we uh, only made this discovery about a couple of weeks ago. So thank you all. everybody. Thanks, Pam, for that introduction, and thanks to the APS for putting on this conference. Um, I'm really struck by a lot of our conversations how we're still surprised we're finding more women in science, and I think that is both wonderful and also a lesson to us that they will always be there. <laughs> so how can we take surprise and turn it into maybe another set of strategic uh, interventions into the field? So I'm interested, of course, in this question of gender and science. My own work is about gender and experimental biology in the long 19th century. And we've heard a lot about how gender structures access to scientific knowledge today, and we'll continue to hear about that. Um, but I've been more interested recently in how gender and class intersect to create different pathways for women moving into scientific institutions in ways that enable them to have financially fulfilling lives. So today I'd like to talk about the experiences of two women who are working in the Museum of Comparative Zoology during the late 19th and early 20th century uh, as a way of considering both the barriers and opportunities they experienced in gaining zoological expertise 
expertise and applying it to a career in science. And I'm the, I, it's like nice to be in a panel full of the history of astronomy. <laughs> so we're going from space to like invertebrates. <laughs> uh, and you know, that's great. <laughs> so uh, on your left, I think, um, this is an image of the Museum of Comparative Zoology. It was originally founded in 1859 by Louis Agassiz, whose reputation has really undergone a revision in the past five or 10 years. Um, by the late 19th century, so the time that I'm focusing on, there are two groups of people in this museum. There are the naturalists who are associated with the Museum of Comparative Zoology, so they're doing research, uh, they're putting on public displays, and then there's a small group of academic biologists in a growing department of zoology associated with Harvard College. So the two women that I want to focus on are Elizabeth Hodges Clark, who you can see in this photo titled Photo of Elizabeth H. Clark Holding a Chair, <laughs> which I think she's just standing there, but that's what you have to call it according to the MCZ archives. Um, and she was a high schooler who graduated from a public high school in 1873, was originally hired as a specimen sorter by naturalist in the MCZ. She came from a lower middle class family. Um, and her job, of, along with a number of other young women who were hired at the same time, was to process the invertebrate collections that were coming into this museum. It was tedious work, it was smelly work, it dirty work, and it was actually incredibly essential to the intellectual work that curators were doing to try to understand specimens and their arrangement uh, in the natural world. Um, the other portrait here is of Edith Nason Buckingham, who came from a very elite Boston-based family. Um, and she was interested in enrolling in the Department of Zoology and getting an education in her own right. Um, so at the time, she enrolled at Radcliffe College, which was the women's college associated with Harvard College. And she was one of many sort of elite society daughters who were, had the privilege of paying for an education and hoped to get the education that they intended. Um, and of course, that became very complicated given the gender antagonism between Harvard and Radcliffe College during that time. So to think a little bit more about Elizabeth Hodges Clark, um, in her first seven years at the MCZ, she was really a paid specimen sorter. Uh, and she worked in particular with a curator named Theodore Lyman to make sense of their echinoderm collections. And he speci specialized in brittle stars and sea stars. Uh, and there's short asides about her research in the official MCZ annual reports. So you'll often see, you know, uh, Miss Clark, as directed by Theodore Lyman, did X, Y, and Z. Um, some of the things that they did is they processed these extensive collections, they put them into glass bottles, and started arranging echinoderms by location and specimen or species type to try to understand the geographical distribution of these organisms. She was great at her job. It's, she really rose through the ranks of these untrained specimen sorters. And in 1880, in 1880, she was hired by the then director of the MCZ, Louis Agassiz's son, Alexander Agassiz, to be his private secretary. That was like a category of work at the time. She specialized in marine organisms, and he himself was an oceanographer, and so that was something that was an asset in terms of her own administrative abilities. Um, and he also, at the time, was the president of one of the most productive copper mines in the world, and so he was away a lot, breaking strikes and doing other things that industrialists were doing at the time. And so she had a lot of time time and space to gain executive authority in the museum itself. And this is an image you can see of Alexander Agassiz's director's office, which she was the only person who had keys to besides him. So you get a sense of her power of place, given the role that she had as her right-hand person. Um, in the correspondence, when Agassiz was away, Clark really became the point person for all museum business. So curators wrote to her asking, should we buy this particular specimen? Should we send this collection of birds out west to an army naturalist who wants to look at them? Should the undergraduates be allowed to touch the bird collection? And one of the interesting things in her response is that she's always trying to make decisions. She was very efficient, but decisions within the narrow confines of what Agassiz would have wanted her to do. So in, case, in the case of the bird collection, she writes back to the curator saying, look, they can use the bird collection the undergraduates if they want, but Agassiz would want to make sure that they're being really careful about damage. So you see how she's, I think, savvy in trying to operation, operationalize her own agency in this role. Um, there's a kind of remarkable letter that I found actually in the Harvard President Archives of so the, the President Harvard of Harvard at the time was Charles Eliot in 1896, which I think gets us as close as we could possibly get to Alexander Agassiz trying to understand that gender is a problem at this time. So, so he, Alexander Agassiz, had just been on this big trip to Australia collecting um, specimens and thinking about coral reefs, and he comes back to the MCZ to just see what's going on, and he's really frustrated that a lot of his directions have been ignored just because Clark was the one who gave them out. 
So he writes to the Harvard president at the time, Charles Elliott, he says, quote, it may be a misfortune that my confidential clerk is a woman, but as long as she is, I propose to back her and no one in my past experience has been so devoted to my interests, so loyal to the museum and so successful in managing things. And I don't propose to sacrifice her because some men are silly enough not to be willing to take my orders through her. And so what's remarkable about this is that both of these men publicly were very against co-education. Um, Alexander Agassiz's stepmother was the president of Radcliffe College, and they were constantly fighting about how he wouldn't give her enough access to space and resources for her students to take zoological classes in the museum. Uh, Charles Eliot was very against co-education for most of his um, career at Harvard. And, but what we have here is men writing in private to each other, and Alexander Agassiz is really trying to recognize, I don't understand, you know, she has my trust, I'm the head of the museum, but there's something about her that these silly men don't understand. So what he's trying to tell us is that gender and power intersect, and in a way that precludes her ability to really have authority in these spaces. So we can think then about Edith Nason Buckingham and her different roots through um, the zoological world. Um, she was born into a very elite Boston family. Both her father and grandfather were Harvard-trained physicians, and her mother came from a line of successful industrial designers. Her father, her, her mother's father, uh, was a person who introduced steam heat to the White House and the rest of the United States. Uh, so they were quite wealthy on the basis of his designs. And Buckingham's family was very invested in this idea of education for women. So Buckingham and her sister Margaret were educated in these very progressive schools in Boston, like the Girls' Latin School, which was one of the first schools designed to train women to go and take and pass college entrance exams. She attended Radcliffe College between 1898 and 1902, um, and then returned again in 1904 for her master's and became the first woman to get her PhD from Radcliffe in 1910. What's interesting about this is that I have two minutes to go. So, <laughs> is that she fulfilled all of Harvard's requirements for a PhD but was given a Radcliffe degree, something that continued at Harvard and Radcliffe until well into the 20th century. So this quote here, I think, gives you a sense of how um, her intellectual achievements were understood and interpreted within her social set. So this is a letter that her cousin wrote to her in 1912 after she received her PhD. Um, Buckingham worked on ant behavior. She was really interested in ant polymorphisms and um, the behavior of um, ants in colonies. And her cousin says, now don't faint. We dined or rather suppered at the prices on Saturday evening, and I broke the news that you were a lady of high degree, if not of several. And what ends up happening is that a number of people at the dinner table, both men and women, are like either underplaying her degree or their faces say unutterable things. She says, next time I shall dwell on your essentially, your, on your essentially domestic nature. So I think this gives us a sense of the kinds of microaggressions that women were expected to hear constantly, especially women like Nason Buckingham, who were supposed to be married and sort of invest themselves in family lives, but instead she invested herself in ant behavior. Um, I think class is something that combated her gender isolation while she was doing her PhD. So there's an image here of the Harvard Devar Department of Zoology from 1900, which gives you a sense of how many women were present uh, officially uh, studying zoology at the time. Because she was so wealthy, wealthier than many of the Harvard instructors and uh, her Harvard peers, she was able to invite them over to dinner at her house and they couldn't say no. And she was also able to study with them and she had a kind of social confidence that counterbalanced her gender isolation. One of the important class-based aspects of Buckingham's life is that while she was unable to find a permanent teaching position, she was able to essentially create her own vernacular scientific institution. So by 1920, she was the sole owner of her family's very nice property in the Back Bay. She sold it in 1927 and bought her own farm in Sudbury, Massachusetts, which is 20 miles outside of Boston. Uh, yeah, got it. And um, there she experimented with the zoological knowledge that she had gained in the world of chicken farming and egg hatching. She expanded her farm from about 1,000 eggs or 1,000 um, birds in 1930 to over 7,000 in the 1950s, along with experimenting with a lot of different ways to grow feed for her chickens and coming up with a way to lend out her farm equipment and get money on the basis of that. Um, so I think this gives us a sense of the ways in which she's able to control her own scientific life, given her own class background. And I will just conclude in sort of thinking a little bit about how partnerships are really important to sustaining long careers in science. 
Um, Clark um, was never married, but she and Agassiz had a, had a long, essentially 30-year relationship as, as close partners. And there's an oral history in the MCZ from Clark's grandniece that suggests that Agassiz had wanted to marry her this whole time. But she had felt like that was, that was something that she was uninterested in because of the possible social implications of that. Um, but instead, he was able to support her financially. So she went from renting an apartment to owning two homes. Uh, and he um, left her almost a million dollars after he died. Uh, in our terms. Um, Buckingham, I think, had a very different sort of life. She had a close partnership with a woman named uh, Emily Fish. They started living together in 1927 in the Back Bay, and then they moved together to Sudbury. And I think with many queer histories during this time, it's sort of hard to describe the exact conditions of their relationship. Because, but because Buckingham was able to control her own residences and her own power, they were really able to have this long, loving, and caring relationship with each other. So I will end with that. Thank you very much. And I am looking forward to Pam's comment. So I really enjoyed these papers. It was a lot of fun to do this from these young scholars. Um, and they're looking at research strategies. We started learning about how to study women in science. Um, for me, at least, uh, influenced by two very important people, Margaret Rossiter, who we hope is watching today, and Sally Kolstad, who is here in the audience. And they came up with some of the early um, things that you needed to look at. And you know, we've seen them here in these papers, family relationships, having an uncle, a brother, being married into a family. These gave you entree into science. Uh, also having mentors, people like Frost at Yerkes who were willing to stand up for women. Um, and Sally talking about coming in from the periphery where women worked on the edges of science, administration, uh, being an assistant in the office, doing scientific illustration, education, and were able to move themselves in. We also saw in two of these papers what I would call the Curie phenomenon, um, which is that when the very dominant, well-known male dies, we suddenly see what the abilities of the women who have been at their side are. And we saw this certainly with Herschel, uh, but with, with Calvert and um, Farnsworth as well. And, uh, you know, I'm waiting for uh, Kristen to begin her set of murder mystery novels on women in science and how they advance their careers by bumping off the males they work with. Just a thought I think would be kind of fun. She's apparently been thinking about it. Um, so <laughs> there's a, a lot of interesting stuff in here. Um, Odile um, took a very fresh look at somebody we know a lot about. You know, we've all know what the Herschels were up to. But she used primary sources to watch the intellectual process that Caroline Herschel went through in reorganizing and then publishing these notes. And it's that kind of deep study of primary sources that really starts to give you a sense of what these intellectual contributions are. And you see that in somebody who's working at that very close level. Um, and I think that this paper uh, really raises those questions. One of the things that I wanted to ask her was, what was the relationship between William and Caroline? So was she just a family member who he expected to do work for him? Or was he a, a mentor to her? Was he encouraging her to take a better role in science? Um, with Chris, uh, Chris Malmieri, um, we have um, Mary Ross Calvert Barnard is her uncle. So she, again, the family uh, connection is getting her to do the work. And um, Farnsworth has a PhD, but she takes a teaching job. She's not getting um, an observatory job. But because these men die, they are able to edit their work, publish it. And I love you know, the continuation of her title, which is Dead Men Can't Write, but then she says, but they can publish. Um, so, <laughs> but if, if they have women who know what they're doing and can help them. 
But one of my questions was, once these women were published scientists with their names on the title page, does it change, and do you, is there any way to find, does it change their attitude about themselves? Do they see themselves as more of a scientist or more accepted in the scientific community once they're on a title page? Because that's extremely important, as we all know, in science. Um, Jeniton took on the greatest challenge, I think, working with two women who we don't know a lot about and who didn't leave a good paper trail. So you've got to really piece together <coughs> what they're doing. <coughs> so she took on these two women, uh, Elizabeth Hodges-Clark. Uh, re she reminds me in a way of what we heard in the paper about the Cancer Research Institute and, and Mrs. Nouts, um, is an administrator a scientist? Where do they fit in the scientific community? So it would be interesting to talk about that anymore, uh, a little bit more in depth. Um, and for Buckingham, there were many, many women who got science degrees who in fact never got a full scientific position, but she then takes hers and uses it in agriculture. She uses the knowledge she received uh, to develop a very successful farming and uh, dog breeding industries in her careers. When women take these other positions and work in them, are they still scientists? Do they consider themselves scientists? Do others consider themselves scientists? Is there any way to know that. Um, so I really liked a lot of these, um, these, but they've taken us beyond our first thing for strategies in science, the early studies. Um, and I think that there are a lot more ways they can move forward. Um, one of the questions that came up just um, with um, Buckingham, was that, do I have the name right? No, with Farnsworth. Um, no, it is Buckingham. Um, she did not want to be regarded as a feminist and was not a suffragist. And I have seen that in several other women in science that I've worked on, Mary Vox Walcott, um, Anna Botsford Comstock. All of these women were higher class. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a certain class sense that your behavior is more proper, but I think it's something that'd be interesting to dis discuss a bit more among women in science is what was their view of women's rights? Were they just special and they should be allowed to do this or should all women be able to do this? So that's another question I would just ask in general. So, uh, shall we open it up to discussion? You guys wanna make a comment first? Is this on? Yes, cool. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much for that question. That's a really interesting one, looking at how to characterize the relationship between um, William and Carolyn Herschel. Um, I think, so you asked whether it was um, kind of, there was a supportive element there or whether he was just kind of exploiting her. And I think it is a, it's a mixture of both of them. So, um, especially at the beginning, there was definitely an element of, of support. So basically the way that this started out was that Carolyn was still in Hanover, um, essentially stuck with her mother, who, uh, according to the sources, was not a very pleasant person to be around. So she had quite a grim future ahead of herself of kind of just doing the household work for her mother without any perspective whatsoever. Um, at this point, William was already in, in England um, working as a musician. And um, so basically he sort of rescu rescued Carolyn um, from um, being stuck in Hanover and took her to England and um, started training her um, to become a singer. Um, so really giving her an opportunity um, to be at least somewhat independent and, and um, pursue a career. Um, so I think that was definitely supportive. Um, this maybe slightly changed when astronomy came, um, started to be his new obsession, um, where he then very kind of, uh, Carolyn didn't have very much choice at that point, so she was, um, she was going to be his assistant now. Um, he adapted the kind of training that he gave to her from um, no longer giving her singing and dancing classes, but now she had to uh, learn mathematics and how to assist him. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely it's the case that, that she was working incredibly hard for him, um, and he 
benefited massively. They worked throughout the nights. There's an account of the kind of ink um, freezing, um, and she could her no longer being able to write because it was so cold. Um, so <laughs> this was like heavy, heavy, demanding work that she was doing. Um, having said that, I think there's still also in the astronomy side there was a supportive element. Um, because simply because at that point in time, um, William, he could have easily claimed Carolyn's comet discoveries as his own. That would have been entirely possible. Um, but he chose not to do that. So that does say something, I think. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you. That's fabulous. Um, so I guess there are kind of two, two ways to answer your question. The first is that, so to my knowledge, Calvert never published anything independently. She was always either billed as kind of completing Barnard's things, like, or as um, kind of a co-author. So she did publish another atlas in the 1930s with Ross, and that's the Ross Calvert Atlas. She gets full billing on that. Um, whereas Farnsworth actually did already have a couple independent publications before this, she had co-authored things with Parkhurst, and this is why it was the natural move to have her come and and finish this um, when she was brought to Chicago, she was brought as a visiting faculty member. So she was actually brought at the rank of instructor, which makes her the first uh, female faculty member at the University of Chicago, um, even though she wasn't tenure track. So like, she had a very different um, le level of authority. And so whereas Calvert publishing the Barnard Atlas all of a sudden made her a superstar, to the point that you know there are lectures being given in her hometown of Nashville, where her name is being put next to you know Cecilia Payne Gasposchkin's, like in the the announcements, right? For, that, that didn't actually happen for Farnsworth because and it, it's I again this is kind of the credit and the acknowledgement puzzle that I'm still trying to parse out, which is why did Calvert have see her star rise so dramatically, whereas Farnsworth kind of just toiled on as a scientist and she kept publishing papers. And she did eventually get a, a very prestigious fellowship to go out to Lick, um, which was incredibly unusual. Um, but again, these, her work on the Parkhurst um, publication did not seem to impact her reputation in the same way that it did for Calvert. So this is, yeah, it's interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Um, Pam, I really like your question about how Buckingham wasn't a feminist and how can we think about science and feminism from the perspective of women scientists during this time period. I think Buckingham's case, and we see this, of course, in the history of feminism in general, is that gender solidarity doesn't always cla cross class lines and it definitely doesn't always cross racial lines either. And many of these early women, especially early elite women in science, um, are quite conservative in thinking about the role of womanhood. They, of course, are in a situation that is gendered and in a situation that for many of them is really frustrating, but don't always point that out as a problem that suffrage can fix or a problem that rethinking the role of women in society can somehow change. And so it's frustrating to, I think, sometimes to look back at these early women in science and say, you were doing so much, um, but your political opinions were so disappointing <laughs> in certain ways. And I think that is, that is part of like, the messy way that we think about science and politics today, too, uh, especially when you think about the history of engineering or the way in which science can offer economic mobility for certain people. There's like a political co commitment that isn't always attached to that change. Um, as for your question about our scientist administrators... Um, did Buckingham think of herself as a scientist? I mean, to me, that's one of the questions that I'm really interested in and want to hear more about, is how can re we reimagine administrative work as intellectual heavyweight work? Because we, we can't do science without knowing what we know. And I think the thing that Clark was really good at is saying, look, I can run this museum. That's, like, not a problem. I can read all of Agassiz's um, uh, drafts of his papers and help improve it because he often wrote in French and German instead of English. Uh, I, can, I can do all of these things. She never wanted to claim the title of a scientist, but my argument would be actually she's doing scientific work at this scale that is the work of a scientific sponsor, maybe. And in the case of Buckingham, she always thought of herself as a scientist in all of her little Radcliffe alumni reports that she would write in she always listed her publications, which was her PhD thesis, and then she also wrote about dog breeding, which is like cool. Um, and I think for her, having that scientific background was a thing that gave her confidence in thinking of her farm as a 
as a scientific operation. Yeah. So we have time for questions, uh, and I'll, I'll stand up, I promise. Uh, okay, I'll start here, and I'll come back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Marina Morari. I was fascinated by all the very, very interesting perspectives, and it's made me really question, isn't it sometimes challenging for you to put our perspective as women today into the heads of the women that you have researched? Because I, I, I was struck and curious if, if you have found in your research of the writings of these women, if they themselves felt frustrated by the lack of acknowledgement, or were they committed and devoted to the intellectual um, exploration that they were pursuing? So they weren't really worried, am I being seen as a, quote, scientist? That's not so interesting to me. I want access to education to be able to do this work. And the same with the question about their political activism. I, I know a lot of uh, engineers and scientists, both men and women, they're not so politically active. They're so invested in their science work that the rest of the world, they, they may be a little bit absent-minded about it, not even so savvy about current political events. So I'm, I'm just wondering if that lens of our, what, what should a woman scientist be interested in active and talking about today is it fair to apply that to some of these women you're looking at? So I'm just, I'm just curious your thoughts on that. So I think I can speak to the first part of the question more strongly, which is that, so in the paper there's a quote from Mary Calvert where she's writing to the press that is publishing the Barnard Atlas and she says, I am an assistant of the observatory. I am not Mr. Frost's assistant. Like, <laughs> <laughs> She's like very clear. She's like, this is my job. And again, actually, I was going to ask Jenna this, but you know, I, I've gone through a lot of the census records for these women, and a number of them will write astronomer. Like that is just that's how they're identifying themselves. And so I do think that a lot of the the women at Yerkes, at least, are claiming what they see as as theirs, and they're really looking for the acknowledgement of their labor. Um, but that's also a, a couple of them did go on to become radical feminist activists in the nineteen teens and 20s. So again, that's um, a clear connection for a couple of them, but for others, yeah, we have no idea. They just don't, don't tell us. Um, I also was going to, I've worked on women in that same time period, Agnes Chase, a botanist, who was a suffragist, who was an early member of the NAACP. Um, I mean, she went to jail because she was burning well, some speeches in front of the White House, and she participated in the uh, hunger strike in Lorton Reformatory. So she was very engaged in women's rights and women's politics and getting credit for women in science. So some of them were and some of them weren't, and we can't expect all of them. And, you know, I love Anna Botsford Comstock, but she really didn't like the suffragists. She made very negative comments about them. Um, and I have to accept her, that that's who she was in that time period. And I, so I think it's, we just have to accept that they have a right to that point of view. Um, but, and it makes, it makes you struggle with them a little bit more, but I think that's good. Yeah, just to comment. So I think for Carolyn, there in her manuscripts and the way that she writes about her work, there you, from that you can't really. There wasn't really an. Uh, she doesn't express any frustration of a, a lack of visibility or a lack of acknowledgement for the work that she did for William. Um, she refers to herself quite the contrary. She, there's one quite famous quote of of her calling her herself. Oh, I'm just his puppy dog, um, you know, carrying out orders. Um, so um, quite the contrary in the way that she writes about herself. But I think we must be really careful in how we interpret that because there is a very um, strong sense of of her kind of needing to navigate that challenging field um, and and world that she was living in and it, she had to be so so careful to not step on anyone's toes and to kind of always hit the right balance of somewhat standing up for herself so that she could actually um, ha make make these achievements but also having an incredible humility 
um, at all times. So I think we must be, um, it is difficult to really get to the bottom of what was actually going on there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's always an active question for me is how do I have my own politics and as a historian, how do I choose topics that I want to think about that align with the things that I want to live now? And I also always think about like my first year in grad school, this difference between actors categories and analyst categories. So how can I maintain and understand the things I want to analyze or have insights about and then the ways in which my actors are deciding and claiming their own lives? Um, so, well, so, you know, this question of gender and feminism is a way to think through those relationships and those categories. There are other women who I work on who did become radicalized. So there's a woman named Blanche Crozer, um, a Blanche, who was also a Radcliffe undergraduate, who was a little bit later, she did her zoological work more in the 19-teens. She went down to the Bermuda Biological Station and did lots of stuff with invertebrate zoology, and she just became enraged. <laughs> she became enraged the way she was treated. She married a scientist. Uh, she thought that she would have this active scientific life as they both ran this biological research station together. And it turned out that once she became a wife and a mother, she didn't have time to do that. And so she turned her rage into this very bizarre novel about sort of the troubles with what it's like to marry into expectations for women. And so, I mean, one of the arguments that I think that many of us are making is that if you don't, if you are sort of excluded from mainstream, mainstream scientific communities, women can find creative ways to channel that rage or channel their artistic creation or channel their interest in science in places that often have like a broader cultural impact or a cultural appeal. So in this case, Blanche not only wrote a novel, she was one of the first like women to go to law school in the 1930s to really focus on how gender as a class is a class of individuals who are oppressed. And feminists in the 1960s used that work to think not only about gender oppression, but also racial oppression. So Polly Murray cites her work, for example, in the 60s and 70s. So, I mean, I'll stop talking, but I think there's just many ways that, that we can find these pathways. And because women are so excluded, the pathways are more creative and the impact is more interesting than just doing science. I don't know what <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for this fascinating panel. And you know, I was, I felt like all of you in intriguing ways, and I think Ada knew this, all of you are getting your, the arc, the, your um, taking records and showing us that these records are telling us more than they mean to tell us. That is, that, there, that Carolyn Herschel is not writing those notes in order to show her agency or her power or her ability to define nature. She's doing it because it's a part of a process that has to do with producing knowledge. Um, the photograph of Einstein is not intended to, to reveal, to out all these women who are in this, in this facility. Um, you know, and I think it, even at MCZ, the purpose of these folks, you're seeing things that are being recorded almost unintentionally. The purpose is not to tell the story of these trivial characters in the history of science, but you find this record there. So I guess what I would invite you all, if you feel like you can, I would invite a commentary on it's almost a methodological commentary. Historians are commonly, and as Jenna's comment suggests, they're commonly using records in ways that were not intended by those who created them. And so how do we do this with, uh, how did you come to see this way of understanding these records? I guess a little bit of a story of, you know, how the archives spoke to you and, and, and how do we, how can we learn from what you've been doing? Yes. Um, so I think I'm gonna I, I'm gonna comment on um, the my analysis of the handwriting for this one because so far in my research that has been a very big part of, of what I've been op been occupying myself with. Um, that's been an essential key to unlocking this archive and will be in the future as well. So. Um, Basically, um, no one thus far has really gone and studied these these two handwritings in sufficient detail to be able to say um, with reasonable certainty, this bit's Carolyn's hand, this bit's William's hand. Um, and I think, um, yeah, that is incredibly important. Uh, just to give you a rough idea of, of um, how I approached this, basically, um, the problem is that the, both of their handwritings are incredibly similar, um, so which which makes sense because they went to the same school, they were taught by the same teacher. So I've been basically um, 
tearing my hair out over this for quite a while. Um, and so one of the approaches has been to just um, to take individual words that will appear frequently in both of these manuscripts, say telescope or I or you, <laughs> and then um, take screen grabs um, of these two manuscripts and kind of collect them all on a pa on a uh, on the same page, and then just like do this for m many different words, and then starting to get to grips with uh, consistent differences in letter formation in um, ductus, so that the kind of flow of the hand. Um, so it's it's a whole it's it's a lot of work that that needs to be done, but that. Um, when it is done, I think, um, puts you in a position to tell some really, really interesting stories of, um, about, with using these manuscripts, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, that's a fabulous question. Um, I think for us, methodologically at least, our goal is to kind of bring everything that we have to the light so that the, the voices of these women can speak for themselves because especially in kind of, because I'm a little bit newer to the field of women in the history of science and also astronomy and astrophysics, when I started doing my own research, I learned a lot about calculators. And I learned about like women's work and like this is what the women are doing and it's route and it's mechanical and then all the men do the real writing and the analyzing and the, the theorizing. And when we actually looked at our records, that's not what we saw. And I think that, you know, that's what we, we really want to make it clear that, you know, the work that's been done has been very good, but perhaps that work does, is not, cannot be extrapolated to all observatories and all places. So we need to go look. We need to, to bring the, their voices out and actually see what they were doing and what they were saying about what they were doing. Yeah, um, I love this methodological question. Yeah, the handwriting, really, <laughs> challenge. <laughs> so interesting about that. Um, I, I am straightforwardly very ins still very inspired by a book I read my first year in grad school, which many of you I'm sure have read, which is Laurel Ulrich's A Midwife Tale. And what I love about that book is how she takes this diary of a midwife in rural Maine from the late um, 1700s and early 1800s and uses it to reconstruct the world of medicine, the social world of childbirth, the social world of medicine during this time period that centers women in the economic fabric and the medical fabric and the cultural fabric of a town. And you know, my work is not Laurel Ulrich's work, but I think that that sort of feminist method of using and triangulating sources to figure out what the hole in the middle is and try to fill aspects of that is something that inspires me as a historian. So, you know, my own dissertation didn't necessarily include these two women, uh, but I start to see them and sort of collect uh, references to them over time, and over time it snowballed into an argument about who they were and what they were doing. Um, and I think a lot of feminist research in history and history of science is interested in reading sources against the grain, finding unlikely sources and having them speak to each other to create a larger portrait of a person. Uh, and it's a kind of archival sleuthing that's also really fun. <laughs> so it's like, you know, whenever you find another letter, it actually magnifies what you can say given the amount of sources that you have. Um, so, so I think this methodological ap approach has a lot of power. No, stop so we're, we're technically at time, but I have two questions on the floor. So we're going to do the rapid fire uh, question and answer portion of our program. So I'm going to let the two questions get asked and then invite the panel to offer responses and final thoughts. My question really follows right along to the prior one, but it addresses the material that you uh, have presented from my particular disciplinary standpoint as a sociologist rather than as a historian. But I can't not say these are three really fabulous characters or sets of characters that you found and uh, the papers are really revelatory. That said, I'm very curious as to whether because you were choosing subjects for research, you chose very special kinds of people. People who could not be considered representative of the other women uh, that were working in one way or another in science at the time. The photograph of Einstein is going to stick in my mind as I think it's going to be <laughs> stick in other people's minds. Who those other who those other creatures were that were standing there apart from 
the focus of the research that you are doing. So the question of representativeness is one that I'm very curious about. And, um, well, as an example, would there be uh, a, a many of the upper class women who turn up like Buckingham um, because they had the wherewithal to do so, whereas the women whose class status um, led them to be a secretary, at least terminologically. Um, so what, what do you know about uh, the, uh, the, the case study problem, which is the one you're addressing? Yeah, I just have more of a comment because there's this has been floating uh, theme in the discussion about whether uh, and the term here has been used administrative work is a, is really science. Uh, uh, one of my uh, heroes was the late uh, Ralph Cicerone, who was president of the National Academy of Sciences. We didn't, and we discussed that. We didn't talk about it as administrative. We talked about institution building and institutional functioning as a contribution to science rather than an administrative work. And, and he was very much in favor of that as a, an appropriate criterion for election to membership in the National Academy of Sciences. He once tried that out on a group out in, I think, in the, the Beckman Center in California, and he was practically booed off the stage. But I still think he was right. Final thoughts. <laughs> um, yes. So I love this question about the representativeness of these women and this question that is tied to it about the case study as an approach to understand women in history. Um, I don't really have a clear answer in terms of the representativeness. I mean, I found so few women archival traces in the MCZ as specimen sorters or as secretaries, and very few women's traces as zoologists who are going through the Department of Zoology. So it's, you know, we maybe have a few extra uh, additional names, but there's just not a lot of information, I think, to answer this question about representativeness in that case. Um, but I think the case study does for us as historians is it allows us to ask big questions on a small scale. And I think that allows us to tell a story of a person, but you're also telling a story about a historical moment or about these larger questions. So for me, for example, talking about Edith Nathan Buckingham is interesting because you get gender and class, you get a sort of a commentary on sexuality and you get a commentary on feminism. And it's nice to anchor that into a person. One practical aspect of this is many archives are organized by the names of people. So, and we've seen the ways in which that is both helpful and a challenge if you're trying to reorganize material given figures that don't, you don't know exist but actually do exist in those papers. And so I remember going to the MCZ very early on as a grad student and I'm like, I'm here to look for women in zoology and the archivist saying, well, what are their names? <laughs> and here's the card catalog that we have handwritten, had not yet digitized. So I think there's this question about the case study as a useful way to pin down the knowledge that you know to start building building out to find additional information about other individuals, but you can speak more. Yeah. No, that's a great question, and I definitely, you know, today I did two case studies, but the, the goal of the larger project is to include far more figures, and especially to highlight those women that are not quite as obviously scientists, or especially those women who took very unusual paths into science. So just to give kind of two very brief examples, um, I'm actually not aware of any of our women at Yerkes coming from extremely elite backgrounds. Um, far more of them are people who came from kind of middle class families who went to the women's colleges and then from the women's colleges um, were then kind of passed to, on to Yerkes through the various networks and uh, forms of patronage. And, um, but yeah, so one of them is a woman, Jessie Short. She was actually the first woman to try to get a PhD from the University of Chicago in astronomy and astrophysics. She failed her qualifying exams. Um, I 
I could tell you who was on the exam committee and then you might understand why she failed her qualifying exams. Um, but she was the daughter of a farmer and was self-motivated and very much self-taught. Um, and another example is we have a woman named Inez Wendell who worked as a computer and her father was the janitor. So, you know, she was a local girl who was just brought in to do a task and performed it well and then was able to use her experience uh, to, to jump on to later things. Um, which is a very long-winded way of saying that we're, we're not looking at the duration of someone's career as the definition of a scientist. Anyone, any woman who came through Yerkes, we are kind of counting her labor as something that was essential to the operations of the observatory. And so we're really trying to redefine the different kinds of labor that we're counting as being essential for scientific research. Yeah, just another brief comment on, on the question about representativeness. That's definitely very relevant for Carolyn Herschel. And um, we can certainly, or I've certainly been seeing this in, in the collections as well. So the sheer amount of material that we have to work with on Carolyn Herschel is incredible. Um, I've, I'm going to have a tough time choosing my, my case studies for the further progress of this project just because there's so, so much material and I'm very aware that this is a unique position and that um, that is simply not representative um, of the kinds of challenges that other historians of women in science are facing. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Great. Um, so with that, uh, I think we're going to take a short break. Uh, so we'll be back here at 11, but in the meantime, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for this really spectacular session. <laughs>